Father, I pray that our hearts would just be open to all that you want to do here this morning, that we could learn what it means to be strong and courageous, to be filled with courage, a courage that's given from you, a courage that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. So we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good to see all of you here this morning. God bless you. I was away uh, this last week in uh, a little town called Matamoros, Pennsylvania. For most of us here as New Yorkers, we know that's the place you go for fireworks. It's just across the border. There's, there's all kinds of fireworks places there, but I didn't go for the fireworks. Well, in a sense I did, but a different kind of fireworks. I was speaking at a church there that uh, is looking to become connected to Elam Fellowship, of which we are a part of here. And so uh, Nick and Gabby, who were part Part of us here they're pastoring in that church as well so it was just a fun time to visit and minister to them but I will say this as much as they were a blessing and I had a wonderful time there there is no place like home amen and uh, so I'm glad to be back with you this morning and so as I was praying through the week and just thinking about what God wanted to bring forth you know the whole concept of courage came to me uh, we live in a fear-filled world, and, and courage is scant around, if you know what I'm saying. You know, even among Christians, it, it's been difficult during these, this season of time that we've been dealing with. And I believe that courage is the ingredient to change a lot of things. Here's, here's the deal. All of us have obstacles in front of us. As you watch the video, you saw that little boy, you know, and he was aspiring to become a musician, and, and uh, you know, he had obstacles at school, you know, getting beat up. Obstacles, his home life wasn't very healthy. As you can see, the parents were yelling at each other. He had the obstacle of, of finances, you know. The list went on and on and on. Uh, you know, he was a little kid, you know, all these different things. And yet he persevered. He had courage to push through those obstacles to achieve the goal that he was looking for. And the thing is, for many of us, uh, what we're looking for, it's going to cost us something. You know, and it takes courage to pay the price at times. And, and sometimes we're, we look down the road and we're like, I can never do that or I can never become that. But here's the thing, we have to look right now and say, how can I become that? And begin to make those choices now to see how God can help us and enable us to get there. You see, each one of us have goals in front of us, but there are obstacles in front of those. You know, I think there are many here, maybe you want a better job. But for that better job, you need this certain degree. That means you got to go back to school. You see, you see where I'm going with it. There's an obstacle, right? And you have to make the decision. Am I going to do what I need to do now to get what I believe I should have later on? And it's the same in relationships. Uh, the, the list goes on and on, you know, uh, you know for, for that spouse that you're looking for, if you're a young person, you know, there's things that you need to do now in preparation so that when that spouse, that future spouse comes along, you're ready for that connection to happen, that godly connection. So it goes on and on and on, these obstacles that are before us. But here's the thing, and if you don't remember anything else, remember this, that obstacles to us in the eyes of God are opportunities. And if we begin as believers in Christ to see obstacles as opportunities, we begin to change that mindset that's in our lives. I'm telling you, it's a life-changing experience. Instead of when something comes out, it's like, oh, no, I can't believe this is happening. Oh, God, why did you let this happen? And those kinds of prayers and that kind of whining and whinging and complaining, listen to me, that will get you nowhere other than just in a pity party in a pit. That, that's where you'll be. But rather, when that obstacle comes up, it says, man, this is something that God can be glorified in. This is, a, this is a, an opportunity to overcome, and it can become, this test can be part of my testimony of God's faithfulness and goodness and love. So often, our biggest battle isn't out there. It's not the obstacle we're seeing. It's the battle that happens inside of our minds to make a decision to do what God's called us to do. And so I encourage you today to begin to, to ask the Lord, Help me to adjust what's going on on the inside. You know, your circumstances may not change very quickly on the outside, but I'll tell you something. When you change positionally and you see those obstacles as opportunities, let me tell you something. You'll be whistling a tune during the day instead of, you know, uh, singing a funeral dirge, if you know what I'm saying, like, oh, woes to me, you know, going to go to the garden to eat worms, you know, that kind of way of thing. It's like, Lord, what an opportunity. This, this is awesome. I'm so looking forward to what's going on today and, and what this obstacle is because you can see past it. You see, God in heaven sees past every obstacle in your life. That's why he sees it as an opportunity. So let's be seated with him in heavenly realms. But I want to talk to you, and all of that is, in a sense, an intro to, to the whole concept of courage. I believe it's an ingredient that all of us need more of. 
including myself. Amen? Everyone with me on that? You, you need more courage? All right, well, then this message is for you today. So let's define the word courage, you know, from the Webster's Dictionary. You know, and here it is. It's the ability to do something that frightens you or it's strength in the face of grief and pain. Let me just read that to you again, and it's up on the screens. The ability to do something that frightens you, strength in the face of grief or pain. Here's the thing. You need courage when you're afraid. You need courage to step forward when you feel everything within you says, run the other way. That's what courage really is. And that could be external or internal, right? You know, we need courage to deal with life. You know, our job, our school, our relationships, all of those things. We need courage for that. But we also need courage on the inside to change our way of thinking. You know, uh, Jack Hayford made this statement, and, and it was kind of an odd statement. And he said this, we need to learn to disagree with ourselves. We need to learn to disagree with ourselves. In other words, there's a part of the old person in us, our, our unrenewed part of our mind that wants to do things a certain way. And for us as spirit-filled believers that want to move forward and excel in God, we've got to disagree with that old person. We've got to say, no, I'm no longer going to think that way. I'm no longer going to do that anymore. And I'm going to move forward and do what God's called me to do. So we need to learn to disagree with ourselves. And, and in a sense, the old self, amen? You know, the new self you want to agree with. You want to agree with what the Spirit of God is saying on the inside. There's a continual battle going on in our lives. Okay. That all sets the stage to where we're going in scriptures today. We're going to be spending the bulk of our time in the book of Joshua. And so if you're not a, not a Bible-looking person, here's where it is. It's right after the book of Deuteronomy and before the book of Judges. And so if you could find it, uh, you know, my page, I can tell you the page in my Bible, but that's not going to be much help to you. Page 194 in my Bible, but I can guarantee it won't be the same in yours especially if it's an app. So, book of Joshua, I'm reading from New King James Version. And there is so much to learn from this portion of Scripture. And I believe that God is going to be speaking to all of us. I know He's spoken to me already, and I find that as I begin to verbalize these things, I learn even more on the fly, so to speak, as we're, we're just speaking together. I have those aha moments happen on the inside of me. So, if you got to Joshua, I hope you got there. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. Verse 4, from the wilderness and, and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea, towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do all according to what is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So as we look at this, first of all, we, it's in the Bible. It's thousands of years old. And, and you know, for some of us, we read that like, okay, great. God's talking to this guy from thousands of years ago. What relevance can that be for me today? Okay, let me tell you something. In every way, all right? Now, there's a couple things I want you to know in advance. First of all, this is a historical book. In other words, what we're reading isn't some fairy tale or some myth. It really happened. And so we need to understand that. And when we look at Old Testament history of what God has done, that gives us learning to understand how God interacts with his people. Is there any children of God here? I hope so. 
all right? So as a child of God, how God acted then, because he changes not, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how he acts and interacts with his people then is how he interacts and acts with us today. And we need to understand that. So that's one reason why we need to read this. But here's the thing. The Bible also says that the Old Testament is a type or a shadow of the New Testament. In other words, we see all these different things happening in the natural, all right? Because here they are going from one place, crossing the Jordan River to go into the land of Canaan, the land you know, that God had promised, and it was a physical land. They were literally crossing a real river with real water, and, and so they're doing all that. But here's the thing. For you and I, the Bible talks about the fact in the New Testament that we have a land of promises as well, that we have an inheritance. And it's not the physical land. We shouldn't all be uprooting and moving to Israel, all right? But, but the idea is that God has given each and every one of us precious promises, and they're an inheritance for us. And so in this, as we look at the type and the shadow of the natural part here, God is showing us how we can enter into our promises. And that's really what I want you to see here today. So we got a natural story, but for us speaking of spiritual truths. And this is just so important. I believe God's got a lot to say with this scripture. So what I want to do is just, just look at a couple of these verses that I read. I always like to kind of read it through so you kind of get the, the picture of it, if you know what I'm saying. So giving you some background. The children of Israel were in exile. They, they were in Egypt for a little over 400 years. Moses led them up out of Egypt to go towards the land of Canaan. They were in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 years. And then Moses died. And then Joshua, his assistant, takes over. So they're literally just at the edge of going into the promised land. And then I read this account. And that's, that's where it is in, in history, okay? How many of you are on the edge of promises being fulfilled in your life. And maybe you've been waiting a long time and nothing's been happening. It's like, God, what the heck? You, know, why? you might even not even use that word, but we're in church, all right? You know, what the heck? You know, why isn't this happening? And here's the thing. I believe there's some answers here for you and I to help us to enter into the promises. And so with that in mind, let's just look at verse 1. I could actually preach just on verse 1, but we're not going to, all right? We're just going to touch on it. And it says, you know, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Okay, th this is huge. It came to pass. What that means, some modern versions say, after many days. Can I tell you something? That if you expect God to be speaking to you like every second, okay, God, what do I do here? Okay, God, what socks do I wear this morning? Okay, God, do I drink orange juice or apple juice? Come on, you got a brain, okay? Function, do the things you need to do. You know, match your socks, you know, match your shoes, you know, get your wife to help you, in my case, to dress because you don't know what you're doing, all right? So, so the point is, you know, just function. Live life, live it for Jesus, but realize that it may be after some time that God will speak. You know, sometimes we read like the book of Acts and we see the apostle Paul and it seemed like, okay, this day God did this and the next day he did this. Can you realize, realize this, that the book of Acts is over 30 years. That means that Paul was in one place for a couple of years. We never even heard what he said or did. Yet what did he do? He lived for Jesus. And that's just so important. Right, right at the opening verse that sometimes you're at the edge of your promises. Here's the thing. You might not be hearing anything specific about what God's telling you to do or how to do it, but live for Jesus, right? In other words, live each day honoring him and glorifying his name so that when it does come to pass, God begins to speak. Because it said, after many days, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua. Let me tell you something. He will speak. There, there's a promise uh, in one of the prophets makes this statement that over a period that God won't tarry, but in his time, he will speak. In other words, God's never early. He's never late. And we just need to be ready with a ready ear, you know, a ready heart when he does speak. And so he speaks, finally speaks. So some of you might be at that place where you're, you're tarrying, <laughs> you're waiting. Can I tell you something? He will speak in his time, amen? Okay, so jump down to verse 3. God says this to Joshua. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. All right, this is just so cool. As you know, if you've been with me any length of time, I like to study out the original Hebrew in the Old Testament and the Greek in the New Testament because that's how the original Bible was written. And here's what it says in the original when it says every place that the sole of your foot, that word place can actually mean 
physical place, or it can actually mean a state of your mind. Oh, see, all of a sudden now, we even have in the Old Testament showing us the seeds that this isn't just about a physical thing. This is about an emotional thing. It's about where you are on the inside. And literally, that's what it says. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. So here's the deal. Each one of us have strongholds in our mind. Each one of us have places and areas on the inside of us that, that are kind of no-go zones in a sense. And God is saying, you need to tread your foot on that. You need to move into that. And you need to begin to conquer these areas. Now, that still applies in another way. Some of us need to conquer some external things as well. You maybe need to go back to school to get that degree. You know, you, you may need to change jobs and you're, you're comfortable and like you don't even have to think at the job you're at now. You know what I mean? You've been doing it so long, you just kind of put your brain on autopilot and then like at five o'clock, oh, well, it's time for me to go home. You, you don't even have to think about it anymore. You know what? Maybe God wants to challenge you to do something that causes you to think a little bit. Can I tell you something? God wants, listen, your job is not supposed to just be a place to get money to go do something else. Come on now, if that's what you're living, begin to pray and ask God for wisdom that your job can be part of your passion, a part of your calling, a part of your Holy Spirit experience, rather than that's, I do that so I can do this over here. Now, there are times that we need to do that, and I get that. But don't look at your job like that. Don't look at going to school like that. Don't look at being at home like that. But see it rather as the whole package that Jesus wants to be a part of everything in every part of your life. Amen? That's for free. I just went off on you. Sorry about that. Anyway, so you got to get back to where I was going here, all right? So, you know, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. In other words, God has these promises. And a little later on, he talks about the inheritance. I'm just going to give this to you right now. Again, you remember this. This is really good. God has given each and every one of us an inheritance. An inheritance of what? Promises. Here's the thing. There's a big difference between having an inheritance, one spoken to you, because, in fact, the Bible even is called the Old Testament and the New Testament, the old will and the new will. So all of these are promises contained within here. But here's the thing. There's a big difference between being promised an inheritance than occupying that inheritance or living the promises. And that's what God has called you and I to do. Not just to hear about it in the Bible and say, oh, that's a wonderful promise. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that promise. And meanwhile, you're living a life of misery. You're living a life of missing out, and you're not experiencing those promises. And there are some Christians that say, well, all those promises is for when we get to heaven. Well, if that was so, then why does he tell us about it now? Why doesn't he say, in heaven... This is what's going to happen. He doesn't say that. He says we're to experience these things here and now. But here's the thing. We've got to take a step forward. We've got to take that step of faith forward and, and occupy the land of promises. And in our lives, that means occupy the areas in our mind that are holding us back from what God's got for us. Are you willing to have courage today? Because God tells Joshua three times to be strong and courageous. In fact, he says, be strong and very courageous, we're going to read about. So here's the thing, for you to occupy what God has for you, for you to experience, this, experience the promises God has for you, it's going to take strength and courage. Without it, you will not be able to. And, and this, this is the ingredients right here. All right, so let's go on. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. So as, I was, so as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. You know, that's quoted in the book of Hebrews, that God will never leave you nor forsake you, that he'll be with you every step of the way. It's not that God is in heaven somewhere, and then when you die, he say, oh, I'm glad you're here. It, that's not how it works. He was with you all the way through life, all the way through here, holding your hand all the way through, if you're willing to acknowledge it. He was there, and then when you get to heaven, it's like, Oh, that was, a, that was a great adventure, Jesus. It's not like, oh, are you Jesus? That's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to experience Jesus here. He's given us the Holy Spirit to live on the inside so that we can experience everything for life and for godliness right here and right now. God is just so awesome. And so going to heaven is like going through one door to another. It shouldn't be this huge drastic change because we should be experiencing his inheritance here. So when we get there, it's just like some finishing touches. That's all. Okay. Verse 7. 
He says again, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do all according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded. Do not turn to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. You know, that word prosper means to have good success. It doesn't necessarily mean become filthy rich. It can mean to be wealthy physically. I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from it, but I'm not saying that's the main purpose of it. In other words, for you to be able to wake up every morning and say, no matter what, how much money is in your account, no matter what else is going on, to be able to say, Lord, I'm just so grateful I'm one of your children. I'm so grateful that you've set this day ahead of me and you've got a plan and it's an awesome plan. And I look forward to what you're going to do. Give me wisdom to connect to that plan. That's the kind of success that God wants you to have. Now, again, will God provide for your needs? The Bible says that none of his children should ever be caught begging for bread. You know what that means? He'll provide for you. As you're doing the things you're supposed to do, he will make a way even where there seemeth to be no way. That, that's just the goodness of God. That's just who he is. And so that's what God wants to do. If, but we have to be what? Strong and courageous. Now look at this verse. If just put it up there. Yeah, there it is. It says, be strong and courageous. Why? This is really important. That you may observe to do all that is according to the law. Back then at this time, all they had was basically the first five books of the Bible. All right? And so that was what is being talked about here. And the idea is that to observe it means to put a fence around it. That's literally what that word observe means. So it doesn't mean, oh yeah, yeah, I know what's in there, and then go doing your own thing. The idea is that you put a fence around it, around your life. That you literally are following what it says. So you're not just observing it to say, oh yeah, I saw that, but observing it and acting upon it. Why? So that you will prosper wherever you go. You see, part of being able to enter into the promises requires courage and strength, but also courage and strength to observe the Word of God. See, if any Christian thinks they can do whatever they want to do and receive the blessings of the kingdom, they are in deception. They're, just, they're lying to themselves, lying to everybody around them, because here's the thing, there are principles and truths we must follow. You know, earlier Brenda mentioned, you know, the concept of giving, you know, sowing, sowing and reaping. Well, there's a principle there. You know, if you expect God to bless you financially, materially, without the principle of sowing and reaping, you're going to do it in your own strength. But if you follow the principle of sowing, it's one of the promises, it's one of our inheritances, then we will be blessed. That's a promise from God's word. So let's jump, jump, jump on here. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. So again, he expands on the last verse, making it very clear that, that not only do you observe the word, but you meditate on it. That word meditate, actually, part of it is to think it, but also to murmur it. It literally means that like under your breath, you're quoting the scriptures. Under, under your breath, you're thinking about God and, and you're talking about him. And that's where our prosperity and success comes from. Okay, and then he finishes out in verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. What a great promise. It's a great scripture to memorize, right? That wherever you go, the Lord God will be with you every step of the way. So as I look at this, and if it ended here, we'd be like, oh, okay, this is what we do. We get to enter into the promised land because they were right on the edge of it. And wouldn't that be great? You know, we could say, okay, praise the Lord, pray a closing prayer, and we all, we all go home, right? Here's the problem. God told Joshua to be strong and courageous because there were some obstacles coming. Can I tell you, and, and you might not want to hear me tell you this, because maybe you come to church to be consoled and be told that, hey, the road's going to be perfect, you know, yellow brick road, you know, literally, you know, daisies are up on each side. It, 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 uh... Can I tell you, you all, including me, have obstacles ahead of us. You might say, well, then what's the point of following Jesus? Let me tell you the point of following Jesus. Without him, you face those obstacles by yourself. With Jesus, you're facing these obstacles that have now been renamed as opportunities. All right, so I want to spend the last few minutes together in Joshua chapter 5. I want to show you the first obstacle. You know, you thought, well, he got to the promised land, everything's rosy. No, they had to push the enemy 
out of the promised land. You see, your enemy are the thoughts and ideas that rise up against the kingdom of God. You have strongholds within your mind that is holding you back from what God has for you, and they have to be pushed out. So in this case, again, this is what, a type or a shadow? There is literally a physical city by the name of Jericho that had walls so wide that history tells us they used to have chariot races around it. All right, so we're not talking about a little skinny concrete wall. Literally, it, you know, they had chariot races with multiple chariots side by side going around this thing. In fact, most theologians believe that it was as wide as it was high. This was just a huge, huge wall. All right, so let's just take a look. There's just three verses I want to look at. Joshua 5, beginning of verse 13. And it says this, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, so they've crossed over into the promised land now, all right? that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? That's a good question, right? So he said, No, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on, the fa on his face to the earth and worshipped and said, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place which you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Listen, I want you to look at a couple of things here. Go, go back to verse 13 for a minute. It says that he lifted his eyes and looked. You know, I wonder whether, and again, I, I'm just wondering based upon that, lifted his eyes. Could it be that Joshua had crossed over, you know, that they crossed over, there's Jericho all walled up, all closed up, you know, thousands of people in their army in behind that wall. And they're, you know, snug as a bug in a rug, so to speak. They're, they got food, they got resources, they could stay there for, for years, literally. And, and Joshua is there on the outside. What do you think Joshua might be doing on the outside? Praying, maybe? Maybe looking down, eyes closed, praying, asking God, what, what do I do here? Because the Bible says that when he looked up, you know, maybe he heard a noise. I, I, I don't know. Maybe the, the sword being pulled out by, by the other person. Yeah, I don't know. Heard something, right? And, and what I love about Joshua, did he run the other way? <laughs> I, I love Joshua, right? He never turned tail and ran the other way. He goes right up to this person. And I'm sure he pulled his sword out too, right? And, and he says, look, and he just asks point blank. You know, back then, I guess he had honesty, right? When you're in the military, you were honest about who you were. He said, look, are you for me, for us? Or for our adversary. Now you'll notice the answer. What was the answer? No. That's kind of a weird answer, right? It's like, no. He wasn't for either, was he? And at that point, after he said, you know, I'm the commander of the Lord host, what, what did Joshua do? Hit the deck. Prostrated before the Lord. See, this is known as what's called in theology a pre-incarnate Christ. You know, a lot of people think Jesus showed up for the first time as a little baby. No, no, he showed up in the form of a baby. I could spend time here and show you that Jesus was at creation at the very beginning. In fact, nothing is created that is seen or unseen that Jesus didn't create. That's what the Bible says. And so he's showing up here, literally came down from heaven to show up to this event. And there's Joshua talking to him. In fact, the reason we can say this with certainty, that any time an angel showed up in the Old Testament and anyone tried to worship them, the angel would say, don't worship me, worship God alone. And in this particular case, this angel, this person, Jesus, did not say that. He was being worshipped. And so, what does this, what does the Lord say? He says, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. You know, that's a picture, again, if you're a Bible reader, if you remember Moses in the burning bush, when God spoke from the burning bush, said exactly the same thing. Take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. There are times when I come here to church and I'm praying and, and sometimes I take my shoes off. I just feel that it's the right thing to do to seek the Lord. I, I remember uh, uh, Alexis Berry came up and did announcements, I don't know, a month or two ago, barefooted. God bless her. You know what I'm saying? The point is so comfortable and, you know, in the presence of the Lord. I've always said that this place should be a, an extension of our, of our living room, amen? And so he, back to what I was saying, he, here, here's the Lord speaking to him and, and so what does Joshua do? We're not going to be reading about it today, but here's the thing. God gives Joshua these crazy instructions. Like, I mean, wackadoodle instructions, all right? 
says, look, at Josh, here's what you do. You take all the army, and what you do is for every day, once, for six days, you march around Jericho. That's what you do. And then you just go back to camp. You do that for six days. Then on the seventh day, you march around seven times that day, and then everyone yells and screams, and when that happens, the walls are going to fall down, and you'll be able to take Jericho. Now, can you imagine Joshua, who had been part of battles? He'd been in the wilderness, fought all kinds of other kings and kingdoms, and, and had tremendous success. This is the first time ever that God's telling him to do this. Now, can you imagine how he's thinking? On the inside, you know, as, as the Lord's speaking to him, he's like, what? You know, what? Seriously? Like, but here's the thing. He knew enough through the strength of his relationship with the Lord that regardless of how he felt, regardless of how he thought it was crazy, that he knew to follow the Lord will always work out. And so we see, and you can go on and read, it's an incredible account, they get the victory. Totally just destroy the place. And it's just an amazing victory. So what can we get out of this? And this is what I want to leave you with right now. Just I want to leave you with what I call two key points in this. And here's the first one. Do you have the courage to bow the knee to the one greater than yourself? See, as I look at Joshua, it takes a tremendous amount of strength and courage to bow the knee, to acknowledge that there's someone smarter than you, someone better than you, someone that knows your future. Are you willing to have the courage to bow to the one, to Jesus? Are you willing to do that? That's a very serious question. And then the next question goes along with it, and, and it's this. Do you have the courage to obey what he tells you to do? And as you look at Joshua, first of all, he had the courage to bow. He knew. Listen, the guy's a warrior. He had won tremendous victories. And, and here he is when he hears it, it's the Lord. Hits the ground in submission. Takes his shoes off, which was a sign of being the lowest of servants in that day. That's what, that's what it means. He realized his position. Do we realize our position that to have the greatest courage of all is to be willing to accept that God knows better than we do? That's a big step for most of us. I know it is for me. I still at times say, God, I got this. What an idiot. Not God, me. You get what I'm saying? What an idiot. I had this happen just a couple of days ago. and It was horrible. Here's what happened. I was on my phone. I was going to send a text to someone to encourage them, right? So I'm, I'm flipping through my phone, you know, the contact thing to find their number. And I saw another name. And God spoke to me and said, contact them right now and let them know that, that I love them, not me, but that he loves them and that everything's going to be okay. You know what stupid me did? I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, God, I'll get to it. And I went back to what I was doing, and then I got caught up watching some stupid YouTube video after that and a bunch of other stupid stuff. I don't even remember all the stupid stuff I did. So then, so then my daughter calls me and says, you know what just happened? This is like an hour later. She goes, you know, and she names the guy, says, his house is burning down right now. Wow. And I could hear the alarm, I could hear the fire trucks going by my house. So, you know, then I sent him a, a text and said, oh, I'm sorry to hear what's going on, praying for you. Wouldn't it have been more powerful if you got the text in advance that said God is with you no matter what's going to happen? Can you imagine the opportunity I missed because I thought I knew better. I wasn't willing to bow the knee in 100% submission. I missed it. I don't want you to miss that. That was a God moment that Jesus could have been glorified. You know, it makes my hair stand up. You know, it's just like, that just was amazing. It could have been an amazing move of God. You know, that person would come and say, man, how, how did you, know? listen, I don't know nothing. God knows everything. And God wants to be with you. That could have been a life-changing moment for that young man and his family. Now, just so you know, everybody was okay. You know, everybody survived the fire. But what a horrible, you know, I'm giving you this bad example. Why? So you don't do the same thing. So that when Jesus shows up and his sword is drawn and he's asking you to do something, that you'll hit the ground and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then when he speaks, you just do it. You know, whatever you're doing is secondary. Whatever's going on is unimportant compared to what God is telling you to do. So he can get the glory. And you get to be part of advancing the kingdom. It's just so much fun. So are you willing to have the courage today? Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Are you willing to have the courage to bow to the one that's greater than you? 
You know, my prayer is that all of you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Obviously, that's the first thing you have to do just to accept Jesus, is to acknowledge him, to bow the knee to him in a sense, and say, Lord, I accept you into my life. What are you doing when you do that? You're, you're accepting the fact that he is a greater one than you. So great, in fact, that he gave his life, amen, so that we could have life. But then the next step is, are we willing to do what he's called us to do? You see, as we read those scriptures in Joshua 1, verses 1 to 9, it talked in several places about following the word, about meditating on it, about guarding ourselves to do what it says so that we can be blessed, be prosperous and successful, as scripture says. So just with every head bowed, I'm just going to ask this question. How many people want more courage in their lives? You know, my hand's up. I see hands raised all through the sanctuary. You can put those hands down. Well, I've given you some ingredients. I've given you a template. And part of it is just to be willing to acknowledge that God isn't going to side with you, but you need to side with him. That's just so, so important. And then as you do that, to have an open heart to follow his direction that he might be glorified. Father, I thank you for every person here. I thank you for those that will be watching the service at the second service. I speak a blessing upon them as well. But Lord, for this congregation that's here, that, that took the time, that, that uh, had the courage to get up and, and drive and come to, come to here to worship you. I pray, Lord God, that that act of obedience, that that, that putting aside of other activities and other things to seek your face, that you will bless them just in that one act alone. That, Lord God, that as I've shared about being courageous and being strong in you, that, Lord God, that that, that, that fear, any, any intrepidation on the inside would be pushed away as they step forward in faith, pursuing you, not seeing obstacles but opportunities before them. Lord, for those that need to change jobs, for those that are dealing with difficult relationships, Lord God, for, for those that are dealing in financial difficulties, that Lord God, right now in the name of Jesus, that they would seek you for direction. And as they bow the knee, that they would see you come into that circumstance and direct them in what to do so that they could have the victory. I thank you, Lord, that you are a good God. And that you have called us, in fact, commanded us to be strong and courageous. So we accept that commandment, Lord God. And we say, yes, we make that decision to be strong and courageous to pursue you. So, Lord God, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, we are here for you. God bless you this morning.